Uh, we do have a number of items that we are covering this morning uh, related to uh, COVID-19, uh, including new changes to the indoor mask mandate uh, that we believe will be really important uh, to be able to protect our children. Uh, we also have an update on our county employee vaccination uh, policy. I know there have been a lot of questions about that, and so we're going to address that and answer some of those questions. And uh, we're working to finalize uh, much of that policy. Uh, and we also have new information on uh, booster shots. We're getting a lot of questions there uh, and their availability to residents. Uh, I'm joined this morning by Dr. George Askew. Uh, I want to thank him uh, for all of his tremendous work. Uh, everyone in our health department want to thank them as well, and you're going to hear from him, and he will give you some additional information. Uh, I also want to outline uh, at a very high level how our county uh, plans to use the $176.6 million in state and local recovery funds that we received under the Federal American Recovery Plan Act, and certainly want to thank the federal delegation that worked tirelessly to make sure that we had those dollars uh, available to us. And finally, we're going to highlight the work of our successful emergency rental assistance program. There is grave concern regarding uh, the ability of many of our residents to remain in their homes uh, as a result of COVID-19. And so we have information we're going to share there. Uh, but first, I want to go to the COVID-19 update. And thanks to our vaccination and masking efforts, uh, COVID-19 has really slowed in our community. I owe a huge uh, thank you to Prince Georgians, who I have to say have done an absolutely beautiful job of adhering to all of the advice that the medical professionals and those uh, scientists have been giving us, including going back to masking indoors very recently. Prince Georgians did so without uh, reservation. And because of that, uh, we are really seeing our numbers going uh, down. Uh, we do, however, continue to see community transmission. Uh, our cases began to rise in early July. And uh, what we know now is that new cases appear to be leveling off and slowly declining. And again, uh, that is attributable solely to Prince Georgians uh, and their diligence and just adherence to all of the policies. And I do want to thank them so much uh, for the beautiful job they did. Dr. Askew will uh, discuss the data in more detail, uh, but we are currently seeing a 3.3% positivity rate in our county. Uh, and we are also, for the first time, this has been the lowest that we've seen since July, this positivity rate. Our infection rate is at 0.93, uh, which is in the medium risk range. And our average daily case rate is at 12 per 100,000 residents, which has declined from over 20 per 100,000. Uh, and that was just at the end of August. And so we are seeing some progress in the right direction. And uh, what we know is the best way to really avoid health implications from COVID-19 uh, remains just to be vaccinated. Uh, the more of us that receive the vaccination, uh, the harder it is for COVID-19 to spread in our community. So there really does not, re there, it remains that the best antidote that we know to this point is to be vaccinated. And we are urging everyone to, uh, to make sure that you and your family members and loved ones are vaccinated. We're really pleased to report that nearly 82% of Prince Georgians, residents are residents who are 12 and over have received at least one dose of the vaccine. Uh, to date, our residents have received over 1 million doses of the COVID-19 vaccine. And I want to take a moment again to thank the hundreds of thousands of Prince Georgians who have stepped up and made the decision to get vaccinated. Uh, they have done so to not only protect themselves, uh, but we know that the most important aspect of it is that you also protect your family and your loved ones and fellow Prince Georgians. Uh, many of you have also heard that the federal government, uh, thankfully, is close to approving vaccines for young children. Uh, and we're waiting for a federal guidance on, on vaccinations for 12 to 11 year olds. Uh, and when they are approved to receive the vaccine, we're, we'll be really ready to provide uh, those vaccines to our children so that they can remain safe. Uh, but what we know is that with more residents getting the vaccine and the case numbers slowly declining, uh, we're trending in the right direction, but what we want is to continue to see those numbers going down. And so, uh, as you remember, of course, we have reinstituted our indoor public mask mandate to stop the spread of COVID-19. And today, I am announcing that we are also expanding the mask mandate to include children 
two to five years old. Uh, that means that when children between the ages of two to five old years old are indoors and in restaurants, uh, they will likewise need to wear their mask unless they are eating uh, or drinking. And previously that mask mandate we know uh, only included children who were over the age of five years old in the county. Uh, as a parent, I understand it, I get it. I know it is not easy uh, to mask younger children, uh, but we are really doing this based on the data that we have and out of a grave concern for our children, many of whom are getting sick. Uh, and so right now our public health officials are concerned that with the spike in COVID-19 cases uh, that we saw in young children uh, between the ages of birth to 17, uh, that we are just gonna have to do more to make sure that we are stopping the spread uh, of this virus. And right now we know that, uh, that many, again, of our kids are impacted. And so we believe that this is uh, what is necessary at this point to make sure that we are protecting them uh, as well. We have heard a lot about the Delta variant and I wanted to, uh, to let you know that the spread of the Delta variant in our community uh, proves that, again, the, the vaccination is the only way to go. And so we've recently been asking county employees uh, to submit information about their vaccination status. And we have done this uh, as a way to finalize our employee policy, vaccination policy. And we're still working to collect information to help us get a better sense for how many of our county employees are currently vaccinated. Uh, but we have found that so far, at least 64% of our employees are vaccinated. And our goal is to get the county government uh, to the same point that we've gotten our general residents. I told you a moment ago that 82% of all of our Prince Georgians uh, have at least had at, w at least one dose, and it is our goal to bring our government employees uh, in line with that data. Uh, we'll be looking at this data also to, um, to, to come up with various methods to ensure the safety of our employees and residents, uh, and we believe that that will include, of course, periodic testing, uh, and incentives also for vaccinated employees. Uh, one of our agencies has already started testing on a weekly basis uh, for all employees who aren't vaccinated uh, in that agency, and that is our Department of Corrections. We've started there uh, because of the nature of that facility with the congregate living. We thought it was important to start with the Department of Corrections, and many of our employees uh, interact with the general public, we know, on a daily basis. And so uh, we are also working to make sure that we implement the, safe, uh, the best and safest way uh, to stop the spread of the virus uh, while making sure that we're also able to continue to deliver critical community services. And so we're going to be working on that. But as we finalize our policies, we will issue additional directives uh, to ensure that every employee knows exactly what will be expected of them. Uh, and whether you work for the county government or not, every Prince Georgian should get vaccinated against COVID-19. Uh, and if you haven't already done so, you can find a COVID-19 vaccine clinic near you. You can go simply to mypgc.us slash COVID vaccine. Again, mypgc.us slash COVID vaccine. Uh, after we've received the green light, uh, from federal and state governments. Uh, we also recently began offering COVID-19 booster shots to residents who received the Pfizer vaccine, and we've done so at the Sports and Learning Center. And based on CDC guidance, uh, we are giving out booster shots of the uh, Pfizer vaccine to people who are 65 years and older, uh, and those ages 18 to 64 uh, with underlying medical conditions. Individuals who are 18 to 64 who work uh, or reside in certain settings may also qualify uh, for the booster shot. And so, for example, if you are between 18 and 64 and you work in healthcare, a school, a grocery store, a correctional facility, or a homeless shelter, uh, you are eligible for the booster shot of Pfizer vaccine. Uh, the CDC recommends that these groups receive a booster shot at least six months after receiving their second dose of Pfizer. And individuals do not have to show proof of eligibility. This is really important. You do not have to show uh, proof of eligibility to receive a booster shot. Uh, but please keep in, time, in, in mind the timing uh, for when you're scheduled for that, for that booster shot. Uh, if you are moderately or severely uh, immunocompromised, you are especially vulnerable to COVID-19. 
And as a reminder, the CDC has approved a third dose of the Moderna or Pfizer vaccine also for those who have weakened uh, immune systems and for people with weakened immune systems, a third dose is recommended 28 days after that initial, uh, uh, after that second dose. Uh, federal health officials have not yet approved booster shots for the general public for either Moderna or the Johnson and Johnson vaccine. And so we're still waiting uh, to hear when those will be authorized. And Dr. Askew will talk more in just a moment about boosters and third doses in his remarks. Uh, but please know that we will continue to provide information to you as we get those updates uh, and get the additional guidance that will be necessary from the federal government. Uh, now on to a few other updates related to COVID-19. Uh, under the American uh, Rest Recovery Plan Act, signed into law by President Biden, our county will receive a substantial allocation of grant funding. Uh, to be exact, that would be $176.6 million in funds uh, to aid our recovery from COVID-19. And our county will use uh, these funds to continue to keep our residents healthy uh, and working to recover and to move forward with a clearer and more secure financial future. And so we're allocating these funds in a balanced way, uh, using those funds for pandemic related expenditures. And that means spending that is directly COVID-19 related, including services to the public uh, and expenses that have arisen as well as a direct result of the pandemic. And we're also using those funds for our behavioral health facility. And this, this will cover uh, indirect costs to county government. It also includes hazard pay, for example, for public and non-public facing essential employees. It covers overtime pay and money to facilitate uh, teleworking that we have found, of course, has become necessary and continues throughout uh, county government. In addition to those allocations, we are using federal funds to aid our economic recovery from COVID-19 uh, while providing support to residents. And so this includes funds for affordable housing. Uh, we're using those funds for a single family rehab grant program and infrastructure also to address residential flooding. Uh, overall, we've allocated these funds in a way that we believe puts the county uh, on the best possible footing going forward. Uh, we've covered the costs we've incurred during the height of the pandemic from um, uh, from personnel to testing and vaccinations. And, and looking forward, we're providing business assistance, funding uh, our homeless shelter, additional food support, and funds also to relaunch our successful rapid reemployment grant program that will help jump, jumpstart even more county businesses. Uh, these funds will go a long way. We believe in securing the financial future of our county and allowing us to make progress for our residents uh, with new programs and initiatives. So uh, in addition to these funds, I wanna talk a bit about the rental assistance program. Uh, we have a substantial sum that we've received uh, federal funds for rental assistance. And uh, recent studies, and we've been tracking this, estimate that between 19,000 and 22,000 households in Prince George's County are at risk for eviction. Uh, our emergency rental assistance program has done an excellent job. We're so proud of it throughout this pandemic. Uh, in terms of keeping Prince Georgians and their families in their homes in the Department of Housing and community development and our community partners uh, really have been doing a, a beautiful job with our rental assistance program. They have uh, done a lot of hard work in terms of intake and processing applications. And I want to thank uh, also the Office of the Sheriff and Community Legal Services for their partnership also in their coordination with DHCD. Uh, the U.S. Treasury Emergency Rental Assistance Program awarded Prince George's County $84 million to assist our residents. And um, so far, our county has assisted 4,134 households uh, with $30.8 million in aid. Uh, this aid has helped with both rental and utility assistance. And our county government, you should know, we are very Prince George's County proud of this, leads the state in distributing emergency rental assistance funds. We are number one in the state in terms of, of allocating those fund, funds. And overwhelmingly, this assistance has reached our least financially secure residents. Uh, now more than ever, the pressure to keep families in their homes is high. And so we are working, you should know, as expeditiously as possible to process more applications for emergency rental assistance. Uh, but despite the fact that we are leading 
uh, a leader in, in the country in terms of the amount of assistance that we have gotten uh, out to our families, we know that there is still so much work to do. And so we, we, we know that landlords are frustrated. We're hearing that the tenants are very frustrated and panicked. Uh, and that these entities are sometimes at odds with each other. And so we are encouraging you, however, just to work together. Um, in this way, we believe that all of us will win and families avoid homelessness and uh, with expanded access to emergency rental assistance, landlord of, landlords also avoid uh, losing thousands of dollars that find, uh, find by finding new tenants and trying to uh, to collect back rent. And so we have plenty more money to spend and plenty of applications to process uh, over these next few months. And we're accepting new applications every single day. Uh, and the program provides, we believe, a really compelling uh, financial incentive to keep families in their homes. Uh, 18 months of past due rent payments are available from the beginning of April 2020. In fact, uh, the Treasury recently released additional guidelines that we implemented uh, aimed at getting assistance to families more quickly and uh, to make sure that we're reaching everyone possible. Our Office of Community Relations is on the move. Uh, they are coordinating with our housing department. And we have put forth a comprehensive outreach program across the county. Uh, we recently launched a rental assistance hotline. Uh, we believe that this hotline will be helpful where residents can go. They get information about the program. They can find out their application status also if they have already applied or schedule an appointment with a staff member if they need assistance with completing the application. The hotline is open uh, is 9 to 5 each day, Monday through Friday, and can be reached at 301-883-6504. Again, that's 301-883-6504. 6504 and you press 9 uh, to get through. Uh, in addition, you should know that we're hosting a number of rental assistance community fairs. Uh, we're excited about these where residents can actually attend, get more information, or to receive on-site assistance in actually filling out those applications. So we're taking a, a mobile kind of approach to this, just going out and about in the community, and we'll be in various places across the community uh, to be able to assist residents in actually applying for those funds. Uh, we held the first community fair last month in Suitland. Uh, we had over 400 residents attend to receive help uh, with applying for rental assistance. And um, just yesterday, we also held a very successful virtual information session uh, for our rental assistance program in partnership with the Collective Empowerment Group. So we want to thank them and thank the faith community who have stepped forward, uh, have been, of course, throughout all of the uh, pandemic have been just amazing partners for us and they continue to do so and so uh, we want to thank them. Uh, our next in-person community fair is this Saturday, October 9th from 10 a.m. until 2 p.m. and that will be held at Langley Park, uh, in Langley Park at the Langley Park Community Center. And if you have questions about rental assistance or need help with applying, uh, please stop by there. So we're committed to ensuring that every resident who needs this assistance will have it have access to it and that they can submit an application. So to learn more about rental assistance, emergency rental assistance, uh, view a list of documents needed to apply uh, and submit, then you just go to hcd.mypgc.us. That's hcd.mypgc.us uh, and click emergency rental assistance program and you can get all the information that you need there. Uh, so again, I wanna thank um, Prince Georgians for just the tremendous job you've done in working together and caring for each other, uh, especially over these last uh, 18 months. This has been a challenging time uh, for all of us, but we've been able to count on you. And so we just appreciate it. Thank you so much. Uh, at this point, I'm going to hand over uh, to Dr. Askew, um, the podium, who will give an update and then we can answer questions. Thank you so much. Good morning, everyone, and uh, thank you, as always, Madam County Executive, for your steadfast leadership. And uh, as uh, I, I like to do, because I don't see it happening all, all across the country, so thank you for believing in the science um, and believing uh, and, uh, and taking the advice of public health officials. It really has made a difference, and you've saved many, many lives, many, many lives. 
Thank you to Prince Georgians. Prince Georgians, you've done a wonderful job, as the county executive has said, of, of standing up for each other, getting vaccinated, wearing masks, and doing those things that we hope to see happening to mitigate the spread of, of COVID. You showed you're resilient by trusting the science, listening to the facts, and making smart choices for your health and for the health of others. The Delta, vi the Delta variant threw us a curveball, but it did not throw us off our mission. Let's begin with an update on the virus in the county. Some of this you heard from the county executive. I'll try to expand on some of the things uh, as I go through. Cases increased, as, as was mentioned, from early, from early July through mid-August, but leveled off. And while they were slowly declining, have actually picked up on their decline uh, as of the last couple of days. For eight weeks in a row, we reported over 1,000 new cases. However, based on last week's data, we are on track to report well below 1,000 cases for the first time since late July. We'll have those numbers out soon. The county is among 22 jurisdictions in Maryland that the CDC reports as having high community transmission. However, our local data indicates we have decreased into the substantial range, so we've moved down a range in terms of transition, which is good, and the CDC will have us there this week, uh, I believe. Last week, we dropped, we dropped below 4% positivity, as you've heard, for the first time since the end of July. The average number of new cases in the county per day is now at 12 per 100,000 population. Still not where we want to be, but headed in the right direction. And while our cases are leveling off, the Delta variant remains the dominant strain spreading in Maryland. It is much more contagious, as you know, and can cause much more serious illness. Unvaccinated residents continue to make up the majority of cases, hospitalizations, and deaths. I can't say and stress enough, the pandemic has become a pandemic of the unvaccinated. If you haven't received the vaccine and you're eligible, you really should get vaccinated. Those who are going to the hospital sickest, those who are dying are those who are unvaccinated in the vast majority of cases. Fortunately, our hospital, hospital capacity remains steady in the 50% range, so our hospitals are in still in great position to help Prince Georgians get the care they need, whether it's for COVID or for something else. We continue to stress, again, the best way to stay out of the hospital or die from COVID is by getting vaccinated. Each vaccine available in the county provides strong protection against getting really sick from COVID, even the Delta variant. The vaccines are effective at preventing most infections. But like most vaccines, they're not 100% effective. So you're seeing breakthrough infections, uh, and that's not a, surprise, uh, not a surprise to us, and it shouldn't be a, a surprise to you. Anyone who has been potentially exposed to COVID-19 or is experiencing flu-like symptoms should get tested, whether they are vaccinated or not, just to be sure. The science is showing even vaccinated people can spread the virus, although at much lower rates than unvaccinated folks. We need to do everything we can to avoid spreading the virus, especially among the unvaccinated folks who are now the folks who are most, uh, most susceptible to serious illness and death. If you're not vaccinated again, you are at much higher risk of getting infected and very sick from COVID. In fact, the CDC recently re released new data showing that unvaccinated people are five times more likely to get infected with COVID than vaccinated people. Five times more likely to get infected than vaccinated people. And unvaccinated people are 29 more times more likely to be hospitalized, 20 times more likely to be hospitalized from COVID than folks who are vaccinated. The vaccines are saving lives. The FDA would not approve these vaccines for us were they not safe or effective against COVID. The wait and see approach is over. The vaccines work. If you're not vaccinated, please get vaccinated. Every vaccination counts towards staying healthy and controlling this pandemic. And as I mentioned before, Prince Georgians have done a great job of getting vaccinated. Over 1 million vaccination, vaccinations have been provided to Prince George's County residents. Now, 
you know, one million vaccines, that's a lot of shots in, in arms, given where we were at the beginning. When, uh, when, I, first, uh, when I first contemplated what, what we would need in the vaccine rollout, I knew it would be well over a million vaccines uh, delivered to folks. And the idea of getting there was daunting. But again, under the county executive strong leadership, the hard work of our Department of Health, our incident command, our Office of Emergency Management, uh, we're, we've gotten to over one million. And I wanna congratulate them all for the hard work that they've been doing uh, in the county and serving Prince George's. The CDC reports that 72%, sorry, 72% of county residents, I just wanna make sure I get, the, never wanna get these wrong, that 72% of county residents 12 and, older, 12 and older are fully vaccinated. That's 72% who are fully vaccinated of those who are currently eligible for vaccines. And over 85% of our residents 65 and older, again, are fully vaccinated, not partially vaccinated. Over 85% are fully vaccinated among our 65-year-olds. Uh, we, as uh, 65-year-olds and above, and we are very proud of those numbers. But frankly, we need more people to get vaccinated. The more people who are vaccinated, the harder it is for the virus to mutate. And when we say mutate, that means the virus changes its, changes its form and becomes a variant. And if we, if we do that, it's harder for the virus to survive, it's hard for it to mutate, and it's harder for it to spread from person to person. So every shot in, in an arm gets us that much closer to getting COVID-19 completely under control. We also must prepare for a possible increase in cases as it gets colder this fall and winter. So it's especially important to get vaccinated now to stay safe and healthy. Now, as the county executive mentioned, third doses of the Pfizer and Moderna vaccine are available for Prince George's who have a weakened immune system. Generally, the FDA has authorized third doses for those who have conditions or take medications that suppress their immune system's ability to fight off infection. We encourage you to talk to your doctor before getting a third dose to make sure it is right for you. The FDA and CDC recently authorized booster shots for the general public. Those eligible to receive booster shots include individuals who are 65 and up, individuals who are 18 to 64 with an underlying medical condition that increases their risk for severe illness, and individuals who are ages 18 to 64 who reside in certain settings that increase their risk of exposure as have been reviewed. That includes healthcare workers, school staff, grocery workers, and those in congregate living, uh, living conditions. At this time, the CDC recommends booster shots only for people who initially received the Pfizer vaccine. Booster shots should be given at least six months after the second Pfizer, Pfizer, Pfizer dose. Booster shots for the general public, for folks who have received Moderna or Johnson & Johnson, have not yet been approved. Third doses and booster shots are available at doctor's offices and clinics across the county, at pharmacies, urgent care centers, and grocery stores. They're also available at our mobile clinics and at our stationary clinic at the Sports and Learning Complex seven days a week. You do not have to go back to the same clinic where you received your earlier doses to get your booster dose. And you do not have to show proof of eligibility to receive your third dose or booster shot. Just remember when you got your, your, your second doses of the vaccines. <coughs> Excuse me. Oh, I think it's important that I take a moment. I think where some confusion resides for folks is the difference between a third dose and a, and a booster shot. Third doses are being recommended of Moderna or the Pfizer vaccine for those folks who are immunocompromised or taking medicines that might make them immunocompromised. So someone who may have had an organ transplant, someone who may have also had some other kind of immunocompromising condition. Um, the reason is when those folks received their first two shots of the Moderna or the Pfizer vaccine, they may have mounted a response that, that took them to a certain level, this level. The normal level for folks who aren't immunocompromised likely would be up here. So it's, just, it's, it's, a higher, it's a higher and a stronger immune response. When you get that third dose, it's hoped that that third dose takes you up to the level of folks who received those first two shots. And so for those folks who may have had two shots of Moderna or Pfizer, who have an immunocompromising condition, who may not have, amount, uh, who may not have mounted a high enough immune response, that's why they're recommending a third dose 28 days, at least 28 days, 
after that second dose was received of Pfizer or Moderna. With respect to the booster shot, the booster shot is given because folks who received the first two doses of Pfizer had a great, may have had a great immune response, but they may have also had what's called waning immunity. So those first two shots took you up here. Over time, they're saying six months or so, it may have come down to here. What this, third do, what this booster dose does is boost that immune response again, and it'll take you back up to here or maybe even higher. Again, it's because the, th the booster dose is to boost the immunity that may be waning, and the third dose is to make sure that the folks who are immunocompromised have the adequate initial response to being, uh, to being vaccinated. So I hope that helps, helps explain some of, some of it. It, it, it. And, and I, I, uh, I sympathize with all of you who hear different explanations, um, hear uh, even the folks at the, who, are, who we rely on for our scientific information going back and forth. But we'll continue to do our best to get the best information out to you uh, in either graphic form or on our website to make sure we keep you up to date with what's what. Our determination to get more people vaccinated and healthy has not slowed down and, and, and won't. And now is a critical time to keep momentum going as our students have officially returned to the classroom for the first time since the onset of, the pan, of this pandemic. I'm really excited about that and really excited about the job that our Prince George's County public school system has done in getting our kids in school and keeping them in school. The county has had success in partnering with the Prince George's County Public Schools to vaccinate students ages 12 and up and other eligible family members through our mobile vaccine clinics at middle schools and high schools this summer and early fall. And we anticipate that the FDA will authorize use of COVID vaccine in children 5 to 11 within the coming days or weeks. We assure you that our health department will again work closely with our public school system to ensure our children and families have access to the vaccine. We encourage parents with children in this age group to speak to your child's health provider if you have questions or concerns about the vaccine and to be prepared to get your child vaccinated when we are given the green light by the federal government. As we remain vigilant in our fight against COVID-19, we must also remember that we are now in flu season. Getting your flu shot is the best way to protect you from getting very sick or dying from the flu. Some people, such as older folks, young children, people with certain health conditions such as heart disease, asthma, or sickle cell disease are at high risk of serious flu complications. Those who skip the flu shot are more vulnerable to serious illness and death and more likely to spread the virus to others around us. The health department encourages those with health insurance to get their flu shots through their primary care provider, a local retail pharmacy, or an urgent care facility. Residents are also encouraged to visit one of several flu clinics being held throughout the county. For more information about flu vaccine and how to receive a flu shot, we encourage you to visit the website health.mypgc.us slash flu. Again, for flu, vet, for flu shot information, health.mypgc.us slash flu. Now getting our children vaccinated against flu and COVID-19 uh, is especially important as we enter to, uh, I think, a fun holiday season. While we continue to navigate this pandemic, we want to take a moment to remind you the of the importance of staying healthy, uh, staying safe and healthy, even as we approach these, uh, these fun holidays. For Halloween, our health department recommends following masking and social distancing requirements while door-to-door -door trick or treating this year. We must stress that anyone showing symptoms of COVID-19 or who has recently been exposed to the virus should not participate in in-person Halloween festivities and should not be giving out candy at their doors. We also recommend practicing additional Halloween COVID safety, safety tips. If you choose to trick or treat door to door, only do so with members of your household. Consider Halloween themed face coverings instead of costume masks. Costume masks have mouth and nose openings, and when worn alone, do not provide the same protection as cloth face coverings. Also, keep in mind that the costume mask on top of a cloth mask can, make, can be dangerous and limit breathing. So we suggest that you wear costume-themed cloth masks instead of costume masks, and certainly not both at the same time. 
Do not share masks. Do not share things like costume fangs or other similar items. Uh, bring an alcohol-based hand sanitizer with you during trick-or-treating and use it often. Avoid touching your eyes and nose and mouth as germs can easily spread that way. Candy should be given out using a scoop or tongs so the candy is not directly handled. And children should not reach into candy bowls or bags. Instead, we recommend providing individually wrapped goodie bags or put on a table at the edge of your driveway or your yard. If you are preparing and handing out treats, be sure you are following proper hand hygiene. When returning home with treats, be sure that children wash their hands properly with soap and water before eating anything. And avoid party games like bobbing for apples or other activities that might involve sharing items that come into contact with other people's mouths or noses. In conclusion, I just want to say the, the science and the message are clear. We have the power to keep each other healthy and alive. I know Prince Georgians care deeply for each other, and I can't think of anything more caring right now than to get vaccinated. Vaccines are free. You don't need insurance. We don't care about your immigration status. We don't care who you, who you are. We only care about your health. Getting very sick from COVID is preventable. Getting sick from COVID, getting very sick from COVID is preventable. It's heartbreaking to know that only a few needle sticks and arms could have saved so many people. Whether it's a booster shot or a first shot, vaccination remains our best tool to protect ourselves and each other from COVID-19. Thanks to the vaccines, getting sick from COVID again is preventable and ending the pandemic is achievable. We have the weapons and, and, the, and we have the willpower and we have, I think, the leadership to make it happen. Thank you. Uh, so thank you everyone with that. Uh, we'll open it up to questions. Uh, I think I saw Brad's hand first and then uh, we'll go to Will and then we'll come over to the side of the room. Um, so I'll answer that in two ways. We are still compiling information. What we've done is to uh, request information from our employees regarding their vaccination status. And what we know so far is that 64% have been vaccinated. Uh, we expect, hopefully, for those numbers to increase as we get more responses uh, from our employees. Uh, but we do know, similar to what we're seeing nationally, that we're seeing lower numbers of vaccination uh, among our public safety employees. Uh, and so we'll be working to uh, to encourage uh, additional vaccinations there and to uh, to incentivize uh, vaccines. So we, are, we but we do see that the numbers um, which are consistent with what we're seeing nationally, that they are lower. Uh, and we have some concern um, regarding, um, you know, just the need to uh, to work with some of our uh, public safety employees um, in, in the vaccinations. You know what? I think that's a question that uh, that's you know being answered across the country, and it'll be our approach to to do what we can to work with them, um, to provide whatever information is needed, whatever education is needed, um, and to provide the opportunity to be tested for those who opt not to be uh, vaccinated, um, and we'll be working with them. They are essential uh, to what we do, and we'll be working hand in hand with them to make sure that they are safe and that our residents are safe. Right. So what we're seeing is that um, is that, of course, some of our kids are getting sick. Uh, we're concerned about that. And we just want to do what we can to um, to protect more and more of them, which is why we've expanded the mask mandate now to also include two to five year olds. We know that masking works. Uh, that's the bottom line is that wearing the mask actually does work in terms of stopping the transmission of COVID-19. And the assumption is not, uh, it is not an accurate assumption to assume that kids can't get sick. Some of them are getting very sick. And, uh, and we believe that it is avoidable if we can wear the mask and, and keep more of them safe. Between 12, the age of 12 and 17, and also 
I got to leave the notes here to make sure I get this. The second part, the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation at, at the University of Washington did a forecast that Maryland could see 6,000 plus cases by November 26th. Just for Prince George's. Uh, are you spreading the word of any, or making sure to ease people concerned that hospitals could see an influx of patients based off just this forecast and also the Frank touched on a few people not still not vaccinated? Sure. Well, let me let me start with your first question. Um, the data for our 12 to what we're seeing for our 12 to 19 year old vac uh, folks who are being vaccinated is that it is now it is now past our 20 to 29 year olds who've been vaccinated. So uh, it's our 20 to 29 year old group of folks that we're actually a little bit a little bit more concerned about because they're the trailing group right now. The 12 to 19 year olds have surpassed that group. They're catching up to our 30 to 39 year olds and our uh, and our 40 to 49 year olds who are sort of our, our leading groups. Our, 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 our seniors are clearly far and ahead above of, of everyone else. But we're happy with where our 12 to 19 year olds are headed. As I said, already have passed our 20 to 20 to 29 year olds. With respect to forecasts, uh, that's the exact reason we want to make sure we don't let up. Even though our numbers are starting to take a dip, we anticipated that they would start to take a dip and may even take a big nose dive down. The lower we get now and the more folks we continue to get vaccinated, the less likely it is that we see a significant surge in that November time period where we start to go into um, you know, Thanksgiving and then we go into Kwanzaa and Christmas and New Year's uh, and, and Hanukkah and, and gathering gath traditional gathering holidays for folks. So again, the lower we get those numbers now, the less concerned we will have to be with those numbers popping up during the, the, the latter parts, the earlier parts and latter parts of the winter. Um, I think it's you know I I don't want to I don't want to I, I can't get into the head of a 20 to 29 year old those are, that was many years ago for me, but but what I can say is that, you know and to, traditionally with any kind of public health um, work done with that that age group is there, for the most part very healthy people. Uh, and consider themselves very healthy people. Uh, many years ago when I worked on, on health care reform and trying to get folks to get health insurance, younger people didn't feel necessarily that they were vulnerable to the conditions that led to issues where you would need to be insured. But I can assure them of this. They are vulnerable to COVID. They will catch COVID if they don't get vaccinated. And some of them may risk going to the hospital, being admitted to the hospital, and some of them may be even risking death by not getting vaccinated. They're young and healthy, but COVID is something else. Sure. No, the school system has been extraordinarily uh, collaborative in reaching out to us for guidance. Uh, we most recently helped them revise uh, their quarantine guidance to make it so that we keep kids in school as, as much um, as possible. Uh, again, a lot of children are still unvaccinated. So we, are, we expect to see cases in classroom. We expect to see folks who have to be quarantined because there were close contacts of cases. Uh, what, we're, what we're not seeing is something that's out of control. What we're not seeing is something that's leading us to closing down full schools. So for the for the time being, um, I'm happy with the way the schools have been handling the situation. In particular, they were out front with making masking a mandate within schools, far ahead of many folks in many other locations. They were far ahead of other folks when they said, we are gonna mandate that our staff and our employees be vaccinated. And so again, I'm really happy with them taking the steps forward to prevent some of the things we're seeing in other parts of the country, even other parts of the state where you're seeing just sort of massive numbers of students who are out of school. Are there any numbers you can give us in terms of maybe 
how kids are being impacted that, that shows, hey, this is why we need to do this, even though our numbers are trending. Sure, and, and I think one of the things we have, to, we have to keep in mind is that we have, from the beginning, uh, did our best to stick to the science, stick with what the what you know uh, the CDC CDC recommendations, um, and we um, when given the opportunity the first time we 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 made our cutoff at at five at five years, um, not knowing when you know when vaccines would become available for younger kids, not knowing what the data might show with respect to what happens when children return to to childcare. Um, now we know that soon. Vaccines are going to be available for that younger age group, uh, those kids five to five to eleven. Those kids below five will still not be eligible for vaccines, um, so they will be our last group of folks who are not eligible for vaccine or who are not getting vaccinated. We need to make sure we protect uh, protect those children. Um, and there are parents, just as you you may be, uh, you know, as Brad mentioned, he's getting, you know, folks who are responding that they may be upset by that. We get, I think, just as many, if not more, from parents who say, I can't believe we're not masking uh, three-year-olds or two-year-olds uh, in the child care center. And folks who are, frankly, who had pulled their kids out of child care settings for fear that their child would get sick. Because they know this is the group of folks, you know, when, when push comes to shove, in the end, they're going to be the last ones to get vaccinated, and we have to do our best to keep them safe. And then on, on, in terms of the booster third dose, um, any concerns about an equitable distribution of those boosters and third doses? All what happened when the initial vaccines rolled out, the steps you all had to take to make sure the most vulnerable were getting their shot in their arm. Um, do you expect to have to use those types of measures again, or is, is this going to be a different kind of scenario? No, we are. We have our eyes on the on the prize when it comes to social justice and social equity uh, with respect to vaccine vaccine distribution, uh, particularly now. You know, of, of our from our previous experience now with the, with the booster, um, I don't anticipate uh, any issues. I would you know welcome you to alert us of any conditions concerns that you might have so that we can address it immediately. But again, I don't anticipate any equity issues. Yeah, I don't. I don't have those numbers on me right now, Brad. But I'll try to. I'll try to to, to dig those up to you and get some of the forward them to you. Actually, make them make sure that they're made available, or at least talk to the schools about their ability to make those those available. Just on Corey's question, I'm wondering more about the the masking for two to five year olds. Is there any the timing of this have anything to do with the weather? I mean, last last time we were coming into the fall, people were worried about getting back into congregate settings, being inside. Is that too simplistic? Is that does that you know? No, we we can we consider many factors, and that's certainly again one of the factors that that we consider going into the going into winter. Uh, more likelihood that folks are going to be in in enclosed spaces, spending a lot more time together. And again, these are going to be kids ultimately who are not going to be eligible for vaccine right away. Uh, two questions for the executive, if you don't mind. Um, do you, off of Brad's question, do we have any numbers for how many public safety employees are not vaccinated, or any any data that we can use to? You know, and so we can, I can get you the exact numbers. Um, it looks like it's a substantial number um, is what we have so far uh, is that there are, um, I'll, I'll have to get you the exact numbers, but it looks like there are a substantial number who are, are unvaccinated. Um, and, you know, we, we, to be honest with you, I think we probably were a little surprised. I thought they would be high, but maybe not as high as they are. They're pretty high. I was going to ask, does that concern you, being that these are the people who are, you know, on the front lines here? Um, it does. You know what? We're concerned both for them and we're concerned for our residents. And, uh, and that's why we're going to have to balance the response to it, um, is to continue to make those vaccines available, to urge um, uh, that people become vaccinated, um, to do what we can to test those who opt not to be vaccinated um, so that they will know their status and so that we will continue to know their status and to do all that we can also to incentivize uh, where possible uh, the vaccinations. And so we're concerned for them and for their families because they go home to loved ones and young children and they are interfacing uh, with our residents. And so we're gonna do everything we can to make sure that everyone uh, is, is as safe as possible. Just really quickly on rental assistance, you said that Prince George's County is doing better than the rest of the state. Can you say why, very specifically, why the, the money is coming out of Prince George's and not other places and how much 
have you been able to give out? So we've given out over $30 million so far. Uh, I think it's about $30.8 million. Um, we're getting it out the door really quickly. And if I just might say something that seems immodest, they're just good. Uh, D D our Department of Housing has just done a phenomenal job. We're very proud of them. Uh, and proud of the work that the entire team has done. They've worked really hard. And you know what, we also want to credit our partners. Uh, we've been working with uh, many in the faith community uh, and working with other community partners who are assisting us. We're going to be working with CASA uh, de Maryland. We're working with a number of community partners who have been committed. Uh, we've worked in Suitland, for example, recently. Community leaders there have stepped up to help us uh, actually get individuals signed up for it, to help them fill out the applications. So everyone's committed throughout. Um, and, and, and so far it's really helping us. Now that isn't to say that we still don't have a lot of work to do because to be honest with you, there's a lot of frustration. The, uh, the tenants are frustrated, the landlords are frustrated, and that's why we're just encouraging everyone, let's please just work together um, as best we can to make sure this happens as quickly as possible. Winter is coming uh, and we want this issue to be addressed and for people to be, um, to be secure in their housing. So we still have a lot of work to do. You know, being first in this doesn't mean that we, we still are not concerned about getting it out quickly. In Langley Park. Yeah. So, you know, I think if, it, if, uh, if Suitland is any indication and we had 400 plus who were there, we expect that Langley Park will also be very well attended uh, and we'll be ready for them. We have our Office of Community Relations working with us and, and again, other partners uh, who are helping us to, um, to serve uh, our residents. We expect it to be robust crowd and we'll be ready to, um, to get people information and to get them um, to help them apply there on, this, on the spot. Okay, thank you, everybody. Uh, oh, thank you. Unrelated. La yeah, last question. Is there, um, uh, County Executive also puts uh, our colleagues at Telemundo um, were wondering if you could respond to some of the criticism that's come out recently uh, from some of the county's Latino and Hispanic leaders um, about what they consider your failure to hire a single person of Hispanic descent to an agency level position since you were elected. Your response uh, to, to those criticisms. Well, that part of it's not true. So we actually did hire, I mean, some of them, we, we had, a, a, you know, wonderful, um, some of the people that we have hired have since left. Uh, one took a job in another jurisdiction at higher pay, one of the d directors that we hired, uh, and we have hired others who have accepted employment in other places. You know what, we continue, we agree that it is a priority to make sure that our government is diverse, to make sure that all of the, uh, that the, that the government's uh, services, that we're making sure that we are um, available and accessible to every aspect of our community. We regard it as a priority as well. We've worked to make sure we attract people to our government uh, of Latino descent. We'll continue to do that because we think it's valuable uh, to have a government that represents every aspect of our community. So I share. Uh, the concern, we've been working with CASA, we've worked with, uh, with some of our electeds and others to ask them to help us identify individuals who are interested in opportunities in the government so that we can interview those individuals and we would love to have um, a, a government that is diverse as possible. We won't give up on that goal, um, but they're right to point out that you know what, it's still a challenge for us and we still have work to do there and we will continue working to, until, we, uh, until we're able to uh, be as diverse as possible in the government. I'll probably tell them we don't ask specifically about, I guess, your exam. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, so we, again, it is, it is the case that we, uh, it, is, it is not true, first of all, that we've not had anyone on the executive staff. Let's clear that part up. That is not true. Uh, we have hired and some of those individuals have left. Um, it is true that we have more work to do and that it is not uh, necessarily easy for us always um, to be able to get the numbers that we would like in. And uh, we just met just last month uh, with Casa de Maryland and said, you know what, we'll continue um, to work with you. Please give us uh, recommendations. Uh, and we've been working all along to, to try to get recommendations uh, so that we can identify individuals if we, as we have vacancies come available. We'll continue to do that because we agree um, that this is something that's valuable to, um, to the government and valuable to our community. The representation matters, we, we agree.